Hello, everyone. I'm Krista Moore, and welcome to The Krista Moore Show. This is brought to you by K-Coaching and ID Growth. This talk show format is a new way to learn from industry experts and thought leaders as they share their growth ideas and different success stories. Today, I have a terrific guest, and he's a colleague of mine and a great friend. I've known Charles for many years. I've always been impressed with his passion for the success of the Independent Dealer Channel, and so I invited him to be a guest so we can learn more about something that he's really passionate about, which is the dealers beginning to diversify, diversifying their offering so that they can continue to be successful. So Charles Foreman, many of you may know, is currently the COO of Independent Stationers and a, a longtime friend and history in this industry. So let's welcome Charles to the show. Are you there, Charles? I'm there here. Thank Hi. you. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm very excited to be here and, and have this discussion with you. And I also understand that there's a uh, special listener out there your mother Susie. So I just wanted to say hi <laughs> to Susie and just tell her how uh, I've enjoyed getting to know you over the years and how much I respect I have for you and what you do for uh, the independent businesses. Thank you, Charles. That's so funny because I, I was telling Charles earlier we had a great group of independent dealers and I'm looking at the list. I go, but the only one that isn't is my mother. And we got a good laugh out of that. Hi, Mom. Glad you could join us. <laughs> Anyhow, Charles, I think it would be great if uh, you could just take a few minutes, and for those that don't know know you, go ahead and give us an introduction. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and a little bit on your background. Okay, sure will. Um, on a personal note, um, I'm, I'm married, been married for tw 20, uh, 29 years. and got to get uh, that one right. I know, I got to get that one right. Uh, <laughs> I have three, three sons, uh, all of whom I'm very proud, and um, so um, I lo like to just say you know, how pleased I am with that. And then from a background perspective, uh, I've been in the you know, office products and related industries for almost 30 years now, in fact, most of my professional career. Uh, and I started out at the independent dealer level and outside sales in the Washington, D.C. market in the late 80s. Um, I quickly learned that I wanted to be in management and even ownership and ended up running the dealership uh, that I started out selling for in the D.C. market and then later had an opportunity to acquire um, a dealership and so I did that and grew it uh, rather successfully for a number of years and by the time we got to the mid 1990s obviously there was a lot of acquisitions going on and I sold my dealership to Corporate Express and I stayed on with them uh, for a number of years and had a had a uh, had a number of uh, different uh, assignments with them. Had a small stint with a furniture manufacturer for a few years. In between joining independent stationers uh, almost 16 years ago, and I've uh, worked for independent stationers in a number of different capacities. I'm currently, as you said, the COO and responsible for sales, marketing, um, recruiting to the group. Uh, our, our furniture offering and IT, and then I have my hand in a number of other projects that arise from time to time, such things as national accounts and federal sales, those types of things. Yeah. And I think the first time we met was probably about, um, I know exactly, it was about 14 years ago because when I started my business and I was introduced to um, independent stationers and, and we did some road shows together for training. But one thing that I was all, I've always been impressed about you is that you, you love this industry and you certainly are experienced and knowledgeable about the, the power channel as well as the independents because you were an independent at one point. Um, so this passion about diversification, we, we've talked about it a lot. And it's something that um, is really comes through very strong. So tell me kind of where that comes from, this whole um, kind of mission that you're on, so to speak, of getting these dealers to understand the importance of that. Um, so my passion for the independent dealer channel and for the need to diversify stems from a couple of different areas. Um, you know, one is the, the, the great people I've 
had the opportunity to meet and work with over the years within this channel and within this great industry, um, both at the at, well at the dealer level and at the manufacturer level and other uh, you know other um, vendors and service providers and even consultants such as yourself. You know that's 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 one area, but the the area most recently that's really driving. You know, my passion for diversification uh, stems around the opportunity. Um, it's no secret that traditional office products and, you know, related categories um, are declining. And uh, so one might say, you know, you're talking about opportunity, but you're also talking about a contracting, you know, channel. And, you know, I just, I believe that the dealers, you know, have tremendous opportunity to sell you know, more and different stuff to existing customers and, uh, you know, also get into selling existing stuff uh, to, to new types of customers, so. Yeah, you know, and, and working with a lot of the um, independents, it's kind of a scary time. There's, there's a, a sense of disruption because of Amazon being in the market as well as the, the power channel, you know, still being very competitive. So the independents that I see that are really thriving and, and continuing to grow in this climate are the ones that are thinking outside of the box and getting creative on, gosh, I know our office products sales are going down, but we've got to replace that and then replace that and, and continue to grow. So, um, but there's plenty that still haven't kind of latched on to that. Um, sense that, hey, if we're going to survive, we need to make some significant changes. So I wanted to ask you from an industry perspective, how does the industry, and when I think industry, I'm thinking, you know, manufacturers, wholesalers, buying groups, um, what's their perspective on all of this, and what are some of the things that they're doing to help, so to speak? Uh, well, I mean, I think you see a number of different op offerings coming from all those organizations you, you just said, the wholesalers, the manufacturers, um, and, and the dealer groups, you know, from, from our perspective, uh, you know, we're trying to create opportunity in these new cap categories for our, you know, our members. And, you know, recently we've aligned with a large uh, dominant uh, Jansan buying group uh, called Aflink. And we created an affiliate program there uh, to try to help give our dealers um, more, you know, skills and uh, opportunities within that Jansan and related space. It's not it's not just Jansan, uh, but that comes in the form of not just cost of goods because many dealers have told us, you know, don't just get us access to product. We need to know how to get into the business. So things like training and marketing, you know, are very important in addition to, you know, good cost of goods and an effective supply chain. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about the whole supply chain, in my mind, I say, gosh, if the independents succeed, then everybody else does, right? I mean, the wholesalers, exactly. the buying groups, everybody cares about their success. So I do see a sense of, you know, let's work together and, and figure out how we can continue to grow this industry and not let market share be taken away. I, I'd like to step back a moment and think about that word diversification. And I mean, when I think about it, I'm thinking product, but I know that it's also different markets that, that they have an opportunity to diversify in. So let's first talk a little bit about the products and what uh, comes to mind. Um, and then we can maybe talk about the different uh, markets or different revenue streams. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's important, you know, to maybe just take a step back and tell you, you know, I see diversification really there being three types, and you know, one is product diversification, as we've, we've touched on here, and that's really selling new products to existing customers. And then, as you mentioned, you know, there's also market diversification and, you know, that's selling existing products into new markets. Uh, you know, and then the third type is really selling is, you know, what I would refer to as full diversification, which is selling new products into new markets. And, uh, you know, obviously we hear a lot about product diversification. 
uh, currently within our channel and you know with you know all, all types of people saying you know the dealers need to be selling Jansan and they need to be selling break room and they need to be selling safety and they need to be selling MRO and you know all of those types of things and the list goes on and on uh, but then there is so that's the product side and then the market side is really dealers getting into selling into new markets such as you know the federal sector uh, if they're not if you know previously they haven't been or other vertical uh, markets such as you know health care or education um, those types of things yeah and when I think about uh, these additional markets and I think there's some dealers that do really well and some that don't know how to approach different markets um, but I understand there's lots of contracts that exist that other dealers can piggyback off of or um, start to get involved with. But I'm thinking uh, healthcare and Premier is an example, and that's with friends. Are there um, other ones that you're thinking about in terms of piggyback opportunities for, for dealers that want to learn more about other vertical markets? Yeah, yeah, there really is. Um, you know, friends and the Premier contract is a, uh, is a classic example. Uh, also through you know our epic business essentials platform uh, there's opportunities for dealers to engage in uh, teaming arrangements to sell in the federal space under a you know a FSSI a federal strategic sourcing initiative blanket purchase agreement that some successful dealers have been awarded uh, that we have on that platform so there's also uh, you know our public sector account years ago we were awarded uh, US communities but uh, later later we've been awarded national IPA which is a public sector account that dealers can participate in and sell to their cities counties schools uh, states and nonprofits under that agreement so yeah there's a lot of opportunities for dealers to jump in and not necessarily have to go out and secure those pieces of business on their own yeah. And so I think we both are confronted when working with dealers, the ones that maybe seem kind of complacent and, and might not be um, growing as fast as others and others that really are thinking more strategically. If I were to ask you, what are, what are some of the things that an aggressive, strategic, diversification um, type dealer is doing? What are some things that they're doing and doing right that we could learn from? You know, that's a great question, Krista. And I think you know the 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 clearest thing that I am seeing that dealers are the successful dealers that are diversifying, uh, be it into new products or into new markets, is investing. And you know, investment means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But in this conversation, what I'm talking about, and I'll just take Jansan for a minute. They're, the dealers I'm seeing be successful are investing in a category management, uh, a manager, somebody who knows the vernacular of the Jansan world, somebody who knows the suppliers, knows the product, knows the questions to ask of the customer so that when you come back with solutions, you're solving the needs that that customer has. Uh, there's, there's also, I've seen dealers be in, uh, successful in investing in making acquisitions within the category that they want to enter because by doing so, they gain all that knowledge that they otherwise would have to do, uh, you know, what they'd have to do on their own. And then uh, the third area I see de successful dealers investing is that in training. Um, in, in, you know, in training their people who are going to represent them in these new categories, again, to ask the right questions, to know the right products, because it's not just about selling product. Uh, it's about providing solutions to your customers' needs. Yeah, I think that's an important piece when we're talking about training. I mean, you know, I live and breathe coaching and training every day, but I, I was really impressed with um, AFLINK when I met them. I spoke at their conference in Washington, D.C. this year, and the type of training that they do for, um, for sales reps and for businesses to really understand um, these other vertical markets and, and these other product categories is pretty intense, um, and I think it's great. 
So, I mean, but that's available. So people need to take advantage of it, I guess. Absolutely. So let's talk about the future a little bit. And um, when you think about this dealer, the dealer channel and, and diversification, is there anything that we should maybe like be thinking about or be aware of or be concerned about? Um, well, I mean, you mentioned you mentioned Amazon. I mean, obviously, that's a formidable competitor. They're a tremendous disruptor. They're they're entering you know the traditional dealer space in a very rapid way. But they're not the only ones. Uh, you know, Staples. You know, they want to have 1.2 million dollar. Oh, I'm sorry, 1.2 million SKUs on their website. You know, in this endless aisle offering too. Uh, and in categories they traditionally haven't sold. Uh, so, um, you know, I think that the online guys are a, are a major um, a major threat. And I think dealers should be thinking about, you know, how to how to you know compete against them and compete against them in you know broader categories and in new markets. Yeah, I want to add something to that because that last statement that you made, they need to know how to compete against them. And I'm just going to, this is like an editorial comment. <laughs> um, so a lot of the dealers that we work with believe that their differentiation is like the one-stop shop or the buy local. But that might not necessarily mean anything to the buyer. Or everybody's saying that they're a one-stop shop because they can get multiple lines and product categories. So my encouragement is to really come up with what your purpose and your why and your branding is for your business and carry that message to the street that is showing the differentiation between you and a, a, a place that you can just get a, a lot of SKUs from, whether you know, that be online or the power channel. So I just wanted to add that in there because it's not, it's not easy. Even if you have all of the variety of products and you've decided to diversify, it's not easy to continue to gain market share without really having a good message and a great sales force. Well, you know, I'd add to that, Chris, and I think you're, you know, absolutely correct. And if you are, you know, you know, promoting your business on the one one stop shop idea, it's more than just saying I have everything. I think you have to connect the dots for your customers on the soft costs associated from buying, and, so, and in some cases hard costs, of buying from multiple manufacturers. And you can quickly take the conversation away from the price of an item to you know, the savings, you're saving the, the organization from an activity-based cost pers perspective. Yeah. Well, and that's like a hot topic these days, right? Because salespeople are trying to figure out how can we change the conversations to have more value and not be focused on price. Um, I'm going to actually make a plug because we have a sale of sales training course starting this Friday. It's free for ID Growth members. We have over 160 people signed up for it already. And it's a four-part series that Phil and I are doing um, over the next four weeks. And so if anybody on the line isn't aware of it, you should be, you should be joining in or having your team join in. If uh, you need some information on that, just send us a, a quick email and we'll get you the registration information. But now's the time to be kind of up-leveling our game, right? Whether it's figuring out what we can do better as a sales organization in our selling style or whether we strategically are trying to figure out what can we do to continue to diversify. Um, before we hang up, though, I, I wanted to hear a couple of, of dealer success stories. I know it's great to always share that, and I'm sure our audience would appreciate it. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us one that comes to mind? Sure, sure. One I'm speaking to, actually, you know, last week was our annual meeting um, out in Las Vegas, and I was speaking to a dealer out there, and they had share, shared with me uh, a story about winning in the, you know, stay on topic, kind of within the Jan Sand space. And... Uh, you know, they were telling me about a huge win that they had, and it was about two years ago. And uh, it was a chain of fitness centers throughout the Midwest. And he walked through the steps that they had to take to even play in this space because they had to hire, you know, a specialist, as I talked about a moment ago, somebody that could, you know, talk the talk with this customer. And then they had to find a source for new products. 
you know, one of the examples he cited to me was the fact that they were now going to be buying 50 gallon drums of soap and what's involved with that, you know, something that the traditional office supply dealer is not throwing on the truck every morning. And it had to match the color and scent of their existing product. And then they had to think about uh, inventorying this type of product, making delivery of this type of product, the equipment handling. Think about, think about the dolly that you use for a 50-gallon drum versus, you know, that for copy paper or something uh, of that nature. So. He said, you know, he just talked through the impact it had on his entire team and then how he positioned the customized billing, the back end reporting uh, that they did, the tools they put in place to control rogue spending by the, you know, the, 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 this fitness centers and um, end users. And so two years later, they have the business and he was excited to report to me that the account does hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year uh, with this with this business it makes a 26 percent margin and their average order size is two hundred and eighty four dollars and nineteen cents per order which is a nice order size and yeah and and the Jan sand category for this dealership has growing significantly and in the last few years has, has been 30 uh, 30 percent up year over year yeah, it's so. interesting too because when when a dealer gets like a flagship account like that, it's a great way to get an entry into that market and start to build credibility as well. So it kind of feeds off of each other, right? Yeah, absolutely. Any other story come to mind? Yeah, you know, I was talking to I got a, I got a whole bunch of them, so we could go all day if you want, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, I, was, I was talking to another dealer about a large university that they were working on and how they were getting them, and it kind of ties back to what we were talking about a moment ago about being, you know, selling more than just what you've traditionally sold and being able to communicate in dollars and cents, you know, um, what one platform, what one delivery, what you know, one bill means to that customer, so that they've been able to for this for this larger university, they've been able to sell them on kind of the one-stop shop, and again, the cost savings associated with that, and quickly moving them away from you know the cost of product. Yeah, I mean, you still got to be competitive, of course, but if you can save them hard and soft cost dollars in the entire procurement process. You know, there's a win there too. Yeah, I have a couple of comments on that. So, um, when we think about diversifying, I'm going to also throw something else in the mix, and and it's it's the size of account. Even if it's a traditional office products account, but if you're going to diversify who your market is, maybe moving up the chain to larger accounts where we absolutely can be competitive. And when you think about it, there's less competition there. In a small, mid-size customer, they've got Amazon, they have all the retail stores, they have independents, they have the power channel, they have the mail order and the quill. There's a ton of competition. Um, but when you move up the food chain to some of the bigger accounts, it ends up being just a handful of you know, maybe national account uh, providers. So the competition's less. The independent can really hang in that market. But what you were just describing, they have an appreciation for those added value services because they're really good at, you know, managing their procurement dollars. And, you know, they have professional purchasing agents that get that. I just find it's, a, it's an easier sell um, on some of those higher-end uh, value propositions and programs. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I agree whole, wholeheartedly. Um, you know, and even within some of these new um, uh, spaces that dealers are getting into, there's, certifica there's certification programs that, you know, you can be a certified, uh, you know, Jansan specialist in particular categories and chemicals and things of that nature. And I think that, you know, that helps too. Because again, as we talked about a moment ago, when you go in to these accounts, you're not just talking about cost of product. You're talking about providing solutions to a customer's need. So. Yeah. 
something I just thought of too to tell the audience. Um, if you're curious about other product categories, and two in particular that I'm thinking about are promotional products and coffee services, we've actually had um, guests on our show that were specific about those product categories, and they shared how to do it and shared some success stories on what dealers have been successful in those areas. So you can go to the Crystal Moore Talk Show dot com and click on past shows and you'll see uh, some of those folks and you can listen and watch to keep educating ourselves um, certainly on what the possibilities are yeah I agree I agree totally so um, I'm about ready to wrap it up is there anything else you wanted to add uh, maybe just a message to to the dealers that are on the on the call today as far as um, diversification goes yeah, so, you know, one thing I'd like to add is just, and, and a dealer who's doing a good job in diversifying um, has shared this with me, is they, you know, they said, go slowly, you know, try to understand what you don't know before just jumping in with both feet. Um, you know, obviously making an investment in a category manager or, manager or through an acquisition, you know, are pretty major steps, and obviously you do your due diligence uh, on before making both of those types of uh, investments. But uh, you know, they say you know, go slowly, learn what it is you're getting into. You know, you may stub your toe a couple of times, uh, but ultimately, you know, with what's going on in the traditional office product space, you know, we need to be diversifying. So, so that's one thing I'd like to say. And then you know, I'd like to leave you with a quote. Uh, from Winston Churchill, and uh, Winston Churchill said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, and an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So I'd like, I like to believe that. that. Yeah, I'd like to believe we're yeah. all optimists, and uh, we're right. facing, facing a few challenges in our industry, but nothing that this group can't overcome, I'm confident. Yep. That's great. No, I love that um, quote. Thanks for sharing that with us today. So before we hang up, I do want to share your contact information in case anybody has any additional questions or want to reach out to you. Is that okay with you? Yeah, please do. Okay. I yeah. We're going to show it up on the screen here. And um, what's the best way to reach you, would you say? Uh, email is probably the best. Uh, my, my cell phone's there too, so feel free to use that, either or. But email probably be the best. Okay. Sounds great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Thank you. I appreciate everything Thank that you, you do for the industry and certainly for being a guest on, on today's show. So um, we learned a lot, and I appreciate that, Charles. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> so um, to the audience, I would love for you to mark your calendar for the Krista Moore Talk Show. It is live the third Wednesday of every month at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. I'll be bringing you special guests and business ideas. And um, you can now just go ahead online and register for upcoming shows and also listen to past recordings. And that's the KristaMoreTalkShow.com. So take a look at that site and go ahead and register. Um, upcoming October 18th, I'm interviewing Steve Cal. And he will be sharing what he's learned about time management and going to be teaching us some things about how we can kind of keep up with our everyday demands, which I think we all could use a little bit of that. So um, at K-Coaching, we care about you and we care about your success. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you next month. Thanks.